is made possible in part by a grant from PNC Bank. You're arrested. You can't make bail. You sit in jail for weeks before your trial, all before you're even convicted of a crime. Is this fair? There's no question that in our justice system, cash talks. But if you can't pay, what happens and who ultimately foots the bill? The problem and solutions coming up on Cleveland Connects, Justice for All. Hello, I'm Mike McIntyre, host of The Sound of Ideas, heard on 90.3 WCPN and seen on the Ohio Channel. And I'm a columnist for The Plain Dealer. Welcome to Cleveland Connects, Justice for All. Tonight, we turn our attention to the criminal justice system in Northeast Ohio. Specifically, we want to focus on the bail system. How does it work? Who gets out and who doesn't? And why does this matter? We're also going to explore how court fees and fines can keep people stuck in the system. We'll look at changes that are in motion. And we'll ask what's needed to help make the system more fair for more people. But first, I want to invite Kristen Baird Adams, Chief Operating Officer of PNC Bank in Cleveland, to the stage to say a few words. PNC provides the financial support for these community conversations. We appreciate their continued investment in this forum. Kristen? Thank you, Mike, and good evening, everyone. It is indeed an honor and a privilege to welcome you to Cleveland Connects, a a series of community conversations and content initiative um, presented by Advance Ohio, representing Cleveland.com and The Plain Dealer, IdeaStream, and PNC. From the outset, Cleveland Connects, now in its fifth year, believe it or not, was designed to lead an engaging dialogue on topics and Uh, that are critical and timely in our community and to advance and sustain those discussions in a way that hopefully inspires education engagement and action we are so proud that cleveland connects has done precisely that including last year's groundbreaking first 2000 days series on the importance of high quality early childhood education and tonight's discussion of great interest here in cleveland and across the country uh, on justice reform None of this would happen without the very best partners, and uh, we'd like to extend special thanks to Chris Quinn, recently promoted as president and editor of Advance Ohio, uh, Kevin Martin, uh, Jerry Wareham, and Mark Rosenberger, and of course, uh, Joe Froelich now, back with IdeaStream, and also the terrific uh, news and editorial teams at both organizations who do an absolutely extraordinary job generating substantive and informative content for all of us each and every day. Our community benefits greatly uh, from your active leadership, from your support, certainly, of Cleveland Connects and so many other programs and initiatives um, that make our community a better place. Uh, We have a terrific live audience, once again, here at the Westfield studio uh, at IdeaStream. And in addition to tonight's session of Cleveland Connects, Um, is uh, airing live statewide on the Ohio Channel, and it's being streamed live at ideastream.org, Cleveland Connects, and on cleveland.com. Mike, as always, we're really fortunate to have you as Cleveland Connects moderator, and we're grateful for your leadership in shaping tonight's program. And with that, I'll turn the program back over to Mike. Thank you, Kristen. Bail reform has been on the minds of many judges in Ohio lately, With the recent release of recommendations from the Ohio Criminal Sentencing Commission, we've got a talented group of panelists to help talk us through these new developments. But first, a story from IdeaStream's Darielle Snipes that shows how the current bail system can harm people who don't have much money. When it comes to the criminal justice system, a person who is accused of a crime has rights. The Sixth Amendment gives defendants the right to an attorney and the right to a fair and speedy trial. The Eighth Amendment says excessive bail shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed. But each day, many defendants who face a judge in Cuyahoga County can't make their bail. Your bond is set 50000 cash already. So they sit in jail and wait for their case to work its way through the courts. That could take weeks or even months, and the impact on that person's life can be devastating. (laughs) Recovering drug addict Willie Brown has lived this. He was arrested several times, mostly for minor offenses, in the last decade. Ended up going to the county jail, and they set a bond for me for $3,500. I was indigent. I didn't have a job. I didn't have anything. All he had to pay was 10% of that bond, $350. But at the time, he was homeless. 
Yeah, to, for me, $350 was a whole lot of money back then. It wasn't nothing I could come up with. So he sat in jail for several months. And when he was sentenced on his drug case, he didn't receive jail time. That happened to him twice, meaning the only reason he sat in jail is because he didn't have any money to bail himself out. This is happening to people with low incomes and people of color more than those who are white or have higher incomes, says Mike Brickner with the ACLU. And so we need to do better in terms of getting people out who are innocent, uh, they've not been convicted of a crime, uh, get them out of jail as quickly as we possibly can. A recent study done by Columbia University researchers and the Maryland Office of Public Defender concluded criminal defendants who were given cash bail as a condition to be released from jail were 12 percent more likely to be convicted and their recidivism rate jumped to almost 10 percent. Brickner also says just 72 hours in jail can have a devastating effect on a person's life, with the potential of losing a job or a house in that time. We need to work towards a system that doesn't rely on cash bail and instead looks at whether or not a person should be released uh, because they're not a threat to the community and they're not a risk of, uh, at risk of flight uh, or if they should be kept in jail because they are a risk. Cleveland Municipal Court Administrative Judge Ronald Adrian says in his 35 years on the bench, he has had to decide in less than five minutes the future of a defendant and try to predict if they will be a flight risk or will reoffend while out on bail. And so you make a decision entirely based upon your view of that person and your gut level feeling about that person. Uh, I'd like to say I was always right. But I know there probably are some times when I was probably wrong. Willie Brown has been clean for two years and is no longer homeless. But he looks back on his time in jail with mixed emotions. I had a court-appointed lawyer that maybe came to see me twice in four months I sat there. No, I knew nothing about the law. I didn't know about getting my charge reduced to a misdemeanor. And so I kind of felt pressured into taking that plea deal at the time and catching my first felony in the state of Ohio. But I also look at the bigger picture, the system that I was caught up in. Like I sat in jail all this time just to let me go. It's disappointing. It's really disappointing. With me now to discuss bail and other issues are Judge Ronald B. Adrian, presiding judge of Cleveland Municipal Court. Also here is Carrie Bloom, legislative liaison for the Office of the Ohio Public Defender, and Judge Kenneth R. Spanigal from the Parma Municipal Court. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Thank, Thank you. you. Judge Adrian, let's start with you. We saw how Willie Brown, who by the way is in the audience this evening, we saw how Willie Brown uh, was affected by, uh, by the financial obligations in the justice system and the inequity that exists. And you're taking actions in Cleveland Municipal Court to counteract that. Can you tell us a little bit about what it is you're doing and why? Sure. Uh, we've been looking at this for a long time. I, a lot of the things that are done in the criminal justice system are traditional. And I say that to say that that's the way we've always done it. And that's why we've continued to do it the way that we have. At this point, however, over the course of the last two or three years, I think across the country, there's been a realization that just because that's the way we've always done it, that's not necessarily the way we should continue. So we've been moving from a resource-based system, one that looks at uh, the crime and puts a dollar amount on what that crime is worth and then makes somebody post a bond according to that, to a risk-based system, which looks at the two things that the Constitution really requires us to be aware of when we're talking about taking somebody's liberty. One, are they likely to appear for court when their case is called? And two, do they pose a risk, a continued risk, to the community? If the answer to the first is yes, they will appear, and to the second is no, they are not likely to be an additional risk, then they are, under the Constitution, required to be allowed to remain at liberty while their case is pending until such time as a jury of their peers or a judge finds that they've actually committed an offense. So that sounds like it makes sense. How come that's not the way it works? That's the way we've always done it. <laughs> so the change is what? Well, the change is to try to find some ways to enhance the, uh, the I guess, the, the ability of judges to feel comfortable when they allow someone out of jail 
that they're going to uh, reappear and that they're not going to be a, a continual risk. What we're looking at is bringing in uh, a tool from the Laura and John Arnold Foundation that gives us that heightened level of confidence by using the experience that they've developed looking at 1.5 million cases and coming up with an algorithm that will give us additional information to heighten that level of confidence. Kerry Bloom, this tool is in place, a similar tool is in place in Lucas County. There are other places that are looking at it. This is not an exclusive conversation in Northeast Ohio. What, what, has, uh, what has it shown? Does it look like that's working and that ideas like what are being employed in Cleveland will work? That's right. Around both our state and around the country, uh, tools like the Arnold tool and other risk assessment um, methods are being used to decide, just like um, the judge was sharing, is someone at a high risk to reoffend or risk to, this, uh, to society and are they likely to come back to court? And what we're finding is that um, when we have a tool that looks at the person themselves and um, their background and all of the um, demographics about them, it comes out with a much better decision um, on those two factors and people come to court and, um, and they, um, they are not a risk um, and they, the levels of recidivism while someone is out is not going up. The, um, the numbers are pretty stark in Lucas County. The, you're right, you're right. They're, um, they're in fact going down. Um, and I believe that they implemented the tool along with um, some other areas in the country with other pretrial um, um, investments in their people, such as sending out text messages to remind people to come to court, or even um, brief phone calls to remind people of their court dates and times. Um, because um, one thing that I think might be a misnomer is people want to come to court and want to resolve their case. And um, there are lots of reasons that we forget or that um, we misplace our, um, our court order sheet telling us when to come. And so in conjunction with that um, Arnold tool or other um, risk tools used and some pretrial investment in people, um, we really are making our communities more safe. Judge Spandigal, this gets to what bail is. It's not a punishment, is it? It's supposed to essentially be there to make sure someone comes back. Bail are the conditions under which you're released from custody, which can be monetary or personal, also, our criminal rule 46, which is the bail rule, includes other factors where I can restrict area of travel. I can place them on various technologies existing now. One of the factors currently is the possibility of other criminal, com criminal offenses happening. Uh, I know our uh, statewide bail report that the Sentencing Commission has put out, Ron and I helped draft some changes to include a risk-based assessment, like the Arnold, to put in a presumption to use non-monetary forms of bail, and also a criminal rule involving the arrest process where to encourage police to what we call sight and release or straight release, petty theft. Give them a ticket, send them on their way instead of arresting them or bringing them to jail necessitating bond. This sounds like something that could be dangerous for a judge though, that if you let somebody out and then they reoffend, then you're looked at as being soft on crime in some way. How does the assessment tool help you in some way to justify that? Well, the, the first thing I think we have to understand is that the purpose of bail is to facilitate release, not to cause people to be retained. Communities, however, look at bail as a punishment in large measure. Uh, so when you see somebody who's charged with what's considered to be a fairly heinous crime on the nightly news and you see that the judge set a million dollar bond, well, that's something that you think good for him. Never mind that the person still has not been found guilty of anything and might actually be innocent. So we take a risk when we don't use a monetary bond because the expectation over time, because that's the way we've always done it, mm -hmm. is that we're going to use money to keep people in jail while their case is pending. Carrie, this seems like a really simple question. It's probably a simple answer, but why is that? Why does that create a disparity? Essentially, if you can pay, you do. Mm -hmm. That that's right. If you can pay, you pay, and you go home. 
and you return to your job the next day, you can you drop your children off at school. If you can't pay, you stay in jail. You don't go back to your job. You don't go home um, and do your chores at night. You don't take care of your children. And all of those things are affected by your ability to pay. I, t I talked to Bob Triazzi, the Cuyahoga County Law Director mm -hmm. today, and he was also talking too about how if his child was arrested, he'd get a lawyer on the case immediately. Mm -hmm. They would look at the idea of reducing it to a misdemeanor, trying to keep it out of the more serious uh, stratosphere. That's also something that takes money to do. That's right. Hiring a lawyer takes money. Quickly. Yeah, hiring a lawyer that shows up right away when you call them takes money. Um, and getting someone on the other end of the line in the prosecutor's office or you know working with the police, um, that takes some resources of some sort. Um, and uh, working for the public defender's office, um, we don't um, we don't enjoy those uh, resources as much. And um, we would like to do the same things for our clients. However, when the bail um, their bail is set so high and um, um, they can't meet their bail, there's kind of an understanding that's um, presumed about them that maybe they are guilty then and maybe they should just stay in jail. Um, so that's what happens. Let's get another thought. We had uh, Shakira Diaz. She's the regional director for the Midwest Alliance for Safety and Justice, formerly with the ACLU locally. She couldn't join us tonight, but she talked with our ideas team last week and brought up the impact of the current bail system, not only on individuals, but on the community at large. Here she is. One example that really stands out to me um, of unnecessary incarceration is a woman who was jailed uh, for a minor traffic stop, was unable to pay for her bail and spent six months out of her pregnancy in jail, unnecessarily lost her home and her housing in the process. The result of that is really a perpetual example of how we are making communities unsafe. When we terminate housing, when we're, we're taking actions that terminate housing, that terminate employment, um, we are jeopardizing not only the health and well-being of that individual, but really the safety of our overall community. What we need in our community are people who are employed, who are healthy, who are supported, and we don't need to have people detained or in jail simply because they can't afford to pay. Judge Adrian, we heard a little bit about public safety there, but there's also a fiscal argument about why, why bail reform should happen. Sure. The, the, the civic <coughs> fiscal argument. Sure, you know, the thing is that when you incarcerate people, uh, it's not like you just uh, put them in jail and that's it. There is a cost associated with that. There's a daily cost. It may be $75 or more per day per individual. The more people that we can safely let back into the community, the less we have to pay, not only for their housing, but also for their medication because a lot of them are ill, uh, for their mental health treatment because a lot of them have mental health problems, um, for a lot of additional uh, things that cause us to have to pay because we've kept them in jail that they can't be treated for in the community. Do you hear the argument from some people that this whole conversation is one that's coddling people who are accused of crimes or criminals. In this case, we're not even talking about criminals. We're talking about people who are accused and not convicted. And I wonder if there's a distinction there. But often we hear that kind of criticism, Judge Spanigal, when we have this kind of conversation. It's mollycoddling. You're innocent until proven guilty. Police obviously have a case. It may not be what they're charged with. And ultimately, there is a criminal disposition that happens down the line. I think the problem is you shouldn't be housing people, as Ron mentioned, because of the charge. Uh, a former friend of ours, retired uh, rehab director, made this expression once, there are bad people and people we are mad at. Now, there's no question, serious sex offenses, murderers, bad people will have bail accordingly that they may not be getting out. But people we are mad at, felony five drug, low level felonies, how much does the state want to expend the expense just because they're mad? And as Ron mentioned, there is a savings in jail cost. Some of that is not going to be in the pocket of somebody in county. It's going to be part of the necessary funding for pretrial services, which is what Lucas County and Summit County have in their budget for those people who determine the risk assessments to enable us to release people on a safer level. We've been collecting questions from our live studio audience, and here's the first one. 
Change in the legal system needs to come from the people who have the authority to make the change. Who really wants the system to change? Because after all, the legal system brings in revenue. The judges have jobs and the attorneys make money. Uh, this is an interesting point and we'll delve into the conversation we're going to be having about collecting fees and fines too. But to that general point, the idea of, of profit motive, uh, Carrie, uh, what about the comment or the question that our audience member asked? I think it's a, it's a great question and it's one that we at, uh, in, in our office talk about every day. And the change has to come um, as the, um, the question states from those who want it. And um, I think identifying those people is part of the struggle that we have. Um, and in, with, um, with regard to costs and, and revenues and receipts coming in, um, I think that um, we have to find the judges and the court administrators who understand that their courts are not revenue makers. They are not a business. They are a branch of government. We don't fund any of the other um, branches of government through user fees, which is what court fees are. Um, and so we should not be relying on our court fees to fund our courts. Um, and it is a place that some jurisdictions have got themselves into. So I think we have to look to the judges who understand that and who are willing to, um, willing to express that out in, uh, into the community. Mike, Judge. some of these things, I think to take that question, who are the players at the particular table? The bail reform rules, which are the criminal rules, comes through the Supreme Court in a process where even tonight, if they were to make change, the earliest would be next July because of our rulemaking process. Some of it is from the General Assembly. That's a financial thing, whereas you see all the things going on in the state with finances, that that's the financial level in terms of some of the things Kerry's spoken about. But I think that, that, that it's also true that a lot of us at the ground level have the ability to affect change if it's our desire to do so. And that we can look at things. We may not be able to do the, the major piece that would come with regard to rule change, but we can do local rule changes that mm -hmm. facilitate some of the things that we've been talking about and make it possible for individuals who are in our custody and control to have a more uh, equitable experience coming through the court system. So that question then means there are some judges who think like you do and some who don't. And I guess that's the question. Where are we in terms of this momentum toward judicial reform? If a judge can make a decision himself to suspend fines and to suspend fees and to set bail at, at lower amounts or personal recognizance, that's a judge's power but they're not employing that, is it because they don't agree with you and how do you change that mindset? I would not say that, that the majority of judges don't agree with the general constructs that I've been talking about, constitutional constructs. Some of them are constrained by the environments that they find themselves in. Uh, Ohio is a hodgepodge of judicial offices across the entire state and that hodgepodge uh, sees judges put into environments where they may have uh, legislative authorities that fund them that expect that those courts will produce certain revenue streams over the course of a given year and when they don't they want to hold them to account uh, and so as a result that may also cause those courts to be less likely to want to change the way that they go about handling things for fear that they'll see their budgets cut and Mike the each judge has their own parameters, if you will. Our nine recommendations from our sentencing commission bail, some of which are specific things like the rules. Mm -hmm. Some of the what I call aspirational goals, because part of it is changing the mindsets, not just of judges, but of the police in charging, the police in arresting. Because remember, everything we do on the bench starts at the front end with law enforcement arresting somebody or citing somebody and making a determination of charges to the local prosecutor, then to the county prosecutor. And, and those things are attitudinal changes that I think comes from changing people as opposed to changing the rules and the laws. A reminder, you're tuned to Cleveland Connects, Justice for All. It's a community conversation produced in partnership with Cleveland.com and sponsored by PNC Bank. 
Appreciate everyone for joining us for the discussion on how to make sure justice isn't based on a person's ability to pay. And I'd like to broaden the scope of our conversation a little bit now. We've talked a little bit about fees and sentencing fines that offenders face post-conviction. We've got a short animated explainer that lays out how these issues are interwoven. When you get arrested and booked into jail, you face a choice even before you go to trial. Here's how it plays out if you're one of the nearly 350,000 people booked into jail in Ohio each year. If you can get a personal bond or post bail, you go free. But if you can't, you and your family pay 10% of that bail amount called a premium to a bail bondsman before you're released. You could also be required to pay fees to the court for things like transportation, general admin costs, and applying for a public defender. And these are usually non-refundable, even if you make every court appearance or you're never convicted. If you are convicted, you could pay additional court fees plus fines. But what if you don't have the money? First off, you sit in jail, sometimes for weeks, before going to court or appointing a lawyer. And as for the sentencing fines, if you fall behind on payments and miss court dates, you could wind up back in jail. While in jail, you certainly lose your freedom, but you may also lose your job, your home, and your ability to support your family. Not to mention losing the ability to pay the fines and fees that got you into jail in the first place. It's not just the people in jail who pay the price. Their families and ultimately their communities have to cover the cost. This leaves many thinking, there's got to be a better way. The Ohio Supreme Court Chief Justice Maureen O'Connor talked about On the Sound of Ideas and on the Tavis Smiley Show, I think you were a part of that show as well that was here in December, about how courts can't be seen as ATMs. And too often they are. We had a question from an audience member that was about that very topic as well. And we covered it to some degree here, but I wanted to drill down a little bit deeper on that. When you have a, a court system that is funded by the fees and fines that it levies, is it a conflict of interest, Judge Adrian? I think that it is. Uh, again, you know, um, as was pointed out, you know, our primary responsibility is to make sure that there are just results for all of the cases and all of the individuals who appear in front of us. And that being the case, if we have to have our eye cocked over our shoulder about whether or not there's going to be enough revenue generated from particular uh, cases, then that impedes our ability to actually focus on justice. So I think that it does constitute a conflict of interest. So where should the money come from? I think that the money should actually come from the general fund of uh, either the community or of the state. And I really think it should come from the state. I think that, that the way that we're, we're balkanized now, as far as courts are concerned, um, makes every local community somehow responsible for uh, funding their court system. But we're all considered, all of us, state court judges. The state should take responsibility for making sure that we're funded. Kerry, uh, do, you believe, do you agree with that? And do you believe that the state should be funding them? You also mentioned that the public defender's office isn't getting a big share of the pie. Sure. Uh, might also get more funding in that way too. What are your thoughts? Sure, I believe that a, a state system has been proven in other states to be the, the most efficient um, in terms of um, fiscally efficient run uh, systems, but also the most efficient in terms of um, public safety. So what we have found in comparing other um, public defender offices is that in a state-run system, um, we could have control over how uh, over the quality of the attorneys that show up in the in the judge's courtroom, which we know affects the outcome of those cases. And we know that when we have higher quality attorneys, we're going to um, hopefully get uh, better better outcomes, faster outcomes, um, and happier clients. Um, so I, I agree with the judge that a state-run system where we can have um, state rules that are enforced by a state agency instead of 88 tiny agencies and 88 tiny um, courtroom rules, all a little bit different uh, like we have now in Ohio, could really be a good investment for our state, um, for our taxpayers, and especially for everyone who's concerned with public safety. 
Judge Spanagle, how does levying a fine against somebody, a misdemeanant, uh, someone with a traffic offense, how does that snowball into the kinds of problems that we're talking about here? It's, a, it's a generally a minimal fine, but why is that different for somebody who can't pay it as opposed to those of means? Well, I think overall, one problem you have is that many of the minor misdemeanor traffic offenses, the only sanction that can be imposed is finances. Every court may have a different process to operate it, but if you're sentenced to and pay, you go pay. If you cannot pay, courts have payment programs that vary. Uh, most courts, Ron's has court community service. We do it in-house where you can do community work service. And we do $9 an hour, which is like a $12 an hour job to work it off, if you will. But there are people who still cannot pay. The law does provide that, in theory, the indigent can ask for what's called an indigency hearing. And if you're found to be indigent, the judge might suspend it or may have you come back at some time in the future because maybe then you have a job. If you don't follow your payment plan, there is a payment hearing. And I realize that sometimes that's difficult because I got to go to court again, but depending on the court, you can contact somebody while you've fallen off the plan. Then if you do not appear or respond in those hearings, then the possibility of a warrant may come, which leads potentially to arrest or potentially to the posting of a bond to secure you to come back to court to discuss the status of your finances. How does that snowball? If I have one ticket and then I don't come back to court, maybe my license can get suspended, and then how does that carry become a bigger problem? Sure, so um, as the judge was explaining, there are, we do have some offenses where the only, um, the only punishment we have is financial. So let's say I get a fine and some court costs that I can't pay, um, and um, then I get a warrant, um, for not paying or failure to pay, and I'm, I come back into court, then I miss work another day. Um, I could spend the night in jail, um, at least a night in jail. Um, I could lose my driver's license, which requires me to go then pay a reinstatement fee, which is another um, large sum of money that goes um, not to the court, but to um, the BMV. And then um, I need to get to the BMV to get my uh, license reinstated, so I either have to take public transportation in um, a place like Cleveland, that's possible, but where I'm from, um, in rural Ohio, that's not possible. So I need to um, likely pay a friend or um, find someone to take me, and um, you can just kind of see how all of these seemingly small um, things build on each other day after day after day. Let me give you another example. Let, let's say, for instance, that, that I'm a person, I've been out at work for a couple of years, I get a a job, but I live in 55th and, and Central, and my job, the one I found, is located in Solon, Ohio. Okay. okay. I don't have any way to get to Solon, Ohio, so I go to, the, to Joe's auto sh uh, store down the street, and I buy a $100 beater so that I can drive out there. Well, my car, you know, is not that reliable. It's blowing smoke, and I get stopped. I get charged with, uh, you know, a muffler that violation then uh, causes me to have to go to court. But I know that if I go to court, that I'm going to have to pay a fine. And I haven't been paid that first time. So I don't go. Warrants issued for my arrest. Now I get picked up by another police officer who says, there's a warrant for your arrest. And oh, by the way, uh, let me see your driver's license. Well, I didn't have a driver's license because I didn't have time to get a driver's license because I just got the car. Now. I get busted for a driver's violation. I can't pay the reinstatement fee. I get charged with driving under suspension. I still don't go to court because I still don't have any money. I had a fellow come in front of me recently who had 22 separate license violations mm -hmm. and reinstatement fees of over $15,000. Mm. I can, I can hear the concern over that, but I can also hear people maybe saying, if your license is suspended, you shouldn't be driving. And sure. that if you do, then you're committing a crime. The same as if you don't have insurance. Some people say, well, that's a minor thing. You were just driving without insurance. But if you run into someone and injure them and don't have insurance, it's a pretty big deal. So what about the idea that what's being done is just wrong? There's no doubt that people need to be held accountable for the things that they do. But what I think we're trying to, to talk about here is the nexus between accountability and money. Because the reason why people do these kinds of things is that 
regardless of how you want to look at it, folks are going to try to take care of their families. And if, in fact, they don't have the money to pay a minor offense, they're going to do the calculus. You know, what, what's, what are my chances? And they'll continue to do those kinds of things until we bring them up short. Mm -hmm. now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't bring them up short. I'm not trying to excuse them. I'm just trying to explain how people get into the kinds of things that they get into sure. and the fact that we need to find a better way to address the underlying reasons that got them there in the first instance. Mm -hmm. So an alternative to the financial picture might be community service, but that also might be problematic because they can't get to the community service. That could be one of, one of the issues there. The it, other except would be that with regard to community service, and I think it's, it's true in Parma, I know it's true in Cleveland, those individuals that run the community service agency will work with people to find some place close to home, some place that they could actually walk if they were of a mind to do that so that they can discharge that obligation to the court. There, there are other kinds of uh, sanctions that some courts have imposed that require a person to go someplace and, and serve what they call a day sentence, which is to, they might have to come and sit in the courtroom you know, for a period of time, spend a whole day in court instead of going to jail because jail is going to be counterproductive. There, the, the, the point, I think, is that we have not spent enough time trying to work this all the way through to try to figure out what's going to be in the best interest, not just of that individual who committed that offense. They are guilty of some kind of a, an offense against our, our community, but does the punishment that we put in place actually, you know, further their interests or ours. And that's the conundrum that we have to get past. Judge Spanigal, an audience question. Does Parma offer community work service in lieu of payment? We do. Uh, and one do of people my do it? Do they, do they, you do know, they show up? I was up? thinking of finding my numbers from 215 because we don't have annual pay. We do. Uh, we run it through our court. Okay, Ron works through a separate agency. And I've always taken the approach. He mentioned about helping them close. I've always told people if you've got an agency close to where you are. We have people from Lorraine, Elyria, Menor. You can find an agency that's acceptable to my people. Go do it where you're at. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have my numbers, but we do it. And this is separate from where we have an option to say in lieu of jail do work service. This is just financial work service. And I do $9, which is probably slightly more than minimum wage. But I always explain, if you were making regular money over the table, that's probably the same as a $12 an hour job by the time you take out your taxes and Social Security. But we do it. Uh, how, how much, I'm not sure. And Ron, obviously, through Court Community Services, they have a great annual report as far as all the cities that use that one for community work service and the amount of, in theory, the value of the work service, as well as how many hours from Cleveland and many other courts in our county. Judge, when you, when you require work service in lieu of payment of fines, do people do it or do they blow that off? Generally speaking, they do it. You know, obviously, Anytime you're talking about individuals who have committed offenses, you have a percentage of folks who are just scuff laws, you know, and you have to deal with those people. But the majority of people, especially the majority of people who have committed traffic offenses, are going to take care of that responsibility. They know that they have an obligation that they need to discharge because they know they did something wrong. So we've talked about how whether the punishment ends up being much greater for somebody who's poor than somebody who's rich. If I get uh, a ticket or any of us here gets a ticket, uh, we can pay it. If you can't pay it, you might end up with losing a job over it. And I wonder about those. And, and Carrie Bloom, have you seen clients who have experienced the kinds of things we're talking about, a loss of job or, or other hardship as a result of something as minor as a traffic violation or uh, driving under a, a suspension or not having uh, insurance when they were driving their car or a muffler. Absolutely. And um, I believe that that is often um, one of the first contacts in my experience that um, people will have in their um, in their young ages, maybe even through the juvenile court. And they start to rack up um, court costs and fines and it starts to feel, um, one of my clients described it to me once as like a pressure. It's a pressure that I can't get out from under, um, that his, um, you know, wealthier or even just um, upper lower class um, peer could pay. And so those two punishments aren't the same for the exact same um, offense. And that's, um, I think that's where we, um, that's why we're here, of course. Um, but, but once you kind of get into the court, 
um, which through a traffic ticket or um, a possession, a minor misdemeanor possession ticket. Um, it's hard to get out of the court. You kind of have to pay your way out. And if you can't do that, then you're going to be in this revolving door that we were talking about earlier that snowballs um, and the court keeps their hooks in you until eventually, um, I know in the jurisdictions I've practiced in, um, the probation department gets involved. And then you have a probation officer. And then there are much more rules, uh, many more rules that you have to follow in your day to day life um, and a lot more opportunities to slip up. Um, maybe for something serious and maybe for something not so serious. Um, and then that, that all comes at a cost, a financial cost as well. And so um, oftentimes um, public defenders meet people on not a great day um, for them on a traffic ticket or a, a misdemeanor. Um, and then we get to know them longer and longer through some very tough days. Um, whereas if we could take care of this up front um, and help them get out of the system, I believe we would keep a lot of people out of the system. One of the things I mentioned, I had a conversation with Bob Triazzi, and he was mentioning about the court sort of acting as a community service agency to, to help people with the problems that they have, not just to levy the fines and the punishment. What about that concept to sort of look holistically at somebody who has a problem and figure out how to solve it rather than go down this road of sanction? You, you know, when you look at somebody who's caught up in the system, they suffer what researchers refer to as cumulative disadvantage. I call it the double whammy. <laughs> I like but, yours better. Yeah, and, and basically what it means is that somebody who has something bad happen to them then has that one bad thing turn into another bad thing, which turns into a cascade of other bad things down the line. Should courts intervene? So is that your courts job? Courts absolutely should be looking at the process of intervening, not because of the fact so much that we even want to help that, per that individual, as it is that we don't want that individual to continue to accumulate those disadvantages that make them then become more significantly likely to become you know, a career criminal. If you stop it at the front, you know, then you can cut off the, all of the things that happen in the back. So if you can't levy a fine against somebody that's not able to pay it because all of these bad things will happen down the line and they'll get these cumulative disadvantages, uh, what are the alternatives? If you, if you put them in jail, if it was time or money and you said we're going to take your time instead, they also might not be able to then go to the job that they got in Solon. Same with community service. If you levy community service on somebody, how can they get to the job that they had? And won't that cycle still be perpetuated? And if that's the question, then really what can you do to hold people accountable but yet not have these sanctions that aren't in, in measure with the crime that was committed? Judge Spanagle? Well, I think first, coming back to your holistic and the double whammy, Pretty much every municipal county court in the state does that, especially with regard to licenses. Whether it's called traffic intervention program, license intervention program, driver intervention program. Ron's got one, I've got one where when you are driving under suspension. And again, that's a good, I call it collateral sanctions of all the stuff that piles up on a license. We sit down with people, and I know there were some yesterday in the Plain Dealer that were bad stories. There's as many success stories, hopefully perhaps more, where we've taken people. I mean, I've got some people six, eight thousand dollars reinstatement fees, but they're in a license, they're driving. Now we are limited too. We can't deal with child support suspensions. Unfortunately, that's through child support agency. But we can do a lot of things. And I think holistically we do a lot of that, at least in the license area. The others, as far as what your final alternatives, sometimes it just gets to the point where if it ain't going to happen, and again, we haven't even talked about people who are on disability or SSI who maybe have a traffic ticket and they have no way of paying, that ultimately the judge or magistrate then can take the authority just to suspend it. Now, that might be two years later, but they've had no other sanctions. If you've had a good driving record for two years, I'd have no problem knocking off your minor fines and costs. What are some other creative things, Carrie, that you think courts ought to do to not just say, oh, well, since, since you can't pay, go ahead and continue to drive uh, in a reckless manner or do these other things mm -hmm. or whatever they might be mm -hmm. to, to then say, okay, you're accountable, but we're taking money out of the system and we're taking jail time out of the system. What, what kind of creative ways can be employed? Sure. So I think the first thing um, that is going to require some creativity on the part of Ohioans is convincing um, the public at large that 
um, we need these creative ways because just because someone can't pay does not mean that they are more dangerous. Um, going back to the um, example we were talking about earlier, um, I wouldn't need a creative way um, to ask for a client who can pay. Um, I wouldn't need a creative um, you know, punishment um, because that person would pay and go on with their way. Um, so we need to be able to talk to each other about what do we really want out of people who come into our court systems. We want better for them because better for them means better for us. And so I think if we're talking about reckless drivers, um, you know, we talk to them about um, why didn't you have car insurance? Can you not afford car insurance? Why is that? Um, why, why were you driving without a driver's license? Um, because you know you should have a driver's license. And um, why didn't you have a driver's license? I think speaking to individual defendants who come into court and are accused with crimes and figuring out um, like the judge said, why did you come here in the first place? What got you here? Um, we'll really learn a lot about people and we can really have some kind of individualized or creative ways um, to help them out of their situations. Well, Mike, you speak of creative solutions. One of the big cascaders monetarily is no insurance on traffic tickets. And obviously that's where big dollars jump up real fast. Uh, two years ago, there was a study commissioned through the Bureau of Motor Vehicles examining most recently changing the way we do our insurance at the Bureau. The bottom line of the proposal, and it now works in many other states, is a vehicle-driven insurance registry the Bureau has, where basically we would exchange the money and use now what's called the random selection non-compliance to target people who are not insured in their vehicle. In other states, they've dropped the uninsured rate 15, 20%. Now, such a system, they didn't put it on the last General Assembly, I think they should, that all of a sudden we're going to see more people who are insured regardless of whatever their driving issue is, but they're not going to be facing the $100, $300, $500, $600 fees, most of which goes to the Bureau. And like Ron said, 15 grand, we've all seen him with healthy four figures, because all of a sudden three tickets in three months and no insurance, all of a sudden you got a whole lot of money to the Bureau. Because you have to understand that with the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, the first time that you get arrested and charged with a violation of not having insurance. You have $300. $100 first time. $100 first time, doubles the second time. Three. I'm sorry. That's okay. I should probably let him take it. We have insurance. <laughs> we have insurance. We don't think about it. Yeah, yeah it's $100 the first time, $300 the second time, $600. Five or six the second, the third time. Yeah, the third time, which is how it very easily, that you know. That snowball. It, mm -hmm. That snowball. I'm not really sure what the Bureau of Motor Vehicles does with all that money, you know, <laughs> but I, I'd like to know be, because if you if we could look at again um, why that is necessary, why they charge so much from people who probably couldn't pay for the insurance in the first place, mm. let alone these reinstatement fees in order to try to get their license back after they've been busted for not having the insurance, we could probably get more people licensed. A lot of these folks who have no driver's license and driving under suspension uh, charges are, are not necessarily bad drivers. Mm -hmm. They're bad licensees, <laughs> okay? And so what we need to try to do is to f figure out ways to get them licensed so that they can operate safely on our, our streets. And if they're not good licensed, or if they're not good drivers, get those folks off the street. Mm -hmm. We've got some questions from our audience. Let's try to uh, get to as many as we can. We just have a few minutes left, believe it or not, in our conversation. It's been a great discussion. Uh, here's a question from our audience. Is there a court office or community agency that's a safe place for people to go for help when they're underwater with court fees? What do you do when you're in trouble? I know there have been various programs through Cleveland Metropolitan Bar, not unlike the safe surrender process, which was for people with felonies and warrants. I don't think there's a safe haven, but you can go to the Bureau of Motor Vehicles online with your social security, four digits, license ID and date of birth, you can get a printout of whatever your issues are, phone numbers of the courts or agencies to call or a lawyer if it's an accident. So if anyone really starts with that, they can at least on the internet get everything they got as a problem and then can start tracking it back. You got to lay out what the problems are before well, you that, start And that's a line. safe haven available online, but there's nobody to help you with it. And, and that's basically what those traffic intervention programs that Kenny was talking about a little bit earlier do. They, they uh, collate all of the things that you have outstanding and then give you give you the sheet 
courts are willing to work with you mm -hmm. in yes. those regards because like I said, our primary thing is that we want more people who are on the street licensed to drive. And so if you go through and you work at it and you get uh, payment plans here, there, at, and everywhere, mm -hmm. you know, then you can get your license and you can start to get out from underneath this weight, this tension. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We've talked about all kinds of fees and fines. We also started our conversation with bail. One of our questions from the audience uh, comes about that is the risk assessment tool, and this is what we talked about, where you might look at that and perhaps issue either a no bail or a lower bail. Is that tool free from implicit bias? Yes. It is. It, has, it has been vetted uh, so that it does not uh, in, you know, impermissibly impact individuals of color uh, and people who are of uh, low income. And so those kinds of things have been worked in to make sure that it does not cause those individuals to be inordinately punished. Carrie? I think uh, what the judge said is right. The tools are validated in a way to try to um, reduce to as close to 0% as in, of implicit biases can possibly be made because they're made by humans who have implicit bias. So um, I'd hate to say 100% bias free, but, but they do, um, like the judge said, they don't rely on race, um, income, neighborhood that you live in, neighborhood where um, the alleged offense happened. All of those things that we know don't have any relation to how dangerous you are as a person or not have been taken out of the consideration of um, whether or not you should be released. This would be a great uh, wrap-up question, and uh, perhaps we'll ha ask another, but this is a, a good uh, way to kind of uh, wrap up our conversation and talk about what we've learned during this hour. And the question comes from our audience member and says, how does one educate the public, giving citizens the opportunity to help make change? This is one way. Uh, the Plain Dealers coverage and Cleveland.com's coverage is another way. Uh, I know you've given many speeches. You've talked mm -hmm. to your fellow judges. What's working, and how do you get this message out to the public that, that levying fines and fees isn't actually helping anybody in, in that way? Judge, start with you. I think that those of us who are true believers are, are, are in a mindset that when two people are talking about this, at all, we become the third. I mean, it's basically the only thing that we can do is to look for opportunities to establish for the general public why this is important and why change is necessary. And to the degree that we're able to uh, make that case uh, and to talk to people who don't see it our way and try to bring them over uh, to understand why this is a positive um, and it's not just Molly coddling, you know, <laughs> criminals, uh, we should be about that. Judge, how about education? I think in the community, the bail process and education is important. So if I let somebody out and the community's not happy, they should understand why. The fines and processes probably could be a whole nother show, because then you get into court funding and stuff. And I'm not sure how much the public's attitudes are going to change on that or not. But for the public to understand not just what we do and why we collect it, but how it is done and why there's a, and not a spillback, but we ultimately have to be uh, respective of our funding authorities, for lack of a better word, that that way the people understand that. We, as Mike Iran said, we're not an ATM. We don't generate any revenue. We generate receipts, whether it's our civil costs, our criminal matters. We can't say what that's going to be because we have no control over the charging process in criminal cases. But for people to understand when they say, hey, you didn't get enough, well, wait a minute, we're not in the job to get more. Judge Pat Carroll from Lakewood Municipal Court does a lot of discussion with the defendants while in court. I know you guys do that too. How important is that, is to make people understand, is to do that right in your courtroom when they're before you? I was explaining the theater of the court. I have 60 people in my courtroom. I'm dealing with one defendant. The other 59 are seeing what's going on and begin to understand the process. And I think that's part of it, plus a one-on-one -on -one dialogue. So, Mr. Adrian, where do you work at? You know, how many kids you got? To determine what I should be doing in sentencing him and figuring out how to arrive at a successful conclusion for Defendant Adrian and Judge Banigal. And Judge, do you use the courtroom yeah, as a pulpit? Absolutely. I, I consider, just as Ken does, that um, courtroom to be a theater 
that individual that I'm talking to is just one of the people I'm talking to. Mm -hmm. Because everybody else in that courtroom is going to decide what they're going to do, how they're going to interact with me based upon what they see me do with that individual. Not just while they're standing there, but after they leave. And so it's important for me to express for them, you know, what's necessary for them to stay both in my good graces and within the law. Mm -hmm. And Carrie, what about education? How, how does the Public Defender's Office approach that? Absolutely. We approach it in similar ways, in, in storytelling, um, telling kind of um, what we consider routine stories, but a lot of people, when they start to hear about them in the general public, they, they can't believe um, what their neighbors or people in other communities are experiencing. Um, I always encourage people um, to talk to their families um, and start kind of the ripple effect there. And of course, you should um, stay in contact with your local um, political um, network. So either county commissioners, let them know how you're feeling or thinking, ask them questions. Um, sometimes they might have a plan um, that they want to share with you. Um, also to talk to your um, statewide um, representatives and senators. Um, we work a lot with them through our office and they definitely get a lot of calls and respond to each and every one. So I would encourage people to do, um, to do that as well because I think you find yourself in a network of others who are interested in the same um, um, the same topics as you are um, that can become a sort of education. What a great conversation. I appreciate all of you guys for being here and joining in the conversation. Thank Cleveland you. Cleveland Municipal Court Judge Ron Adrian, Carrie Bloom with the Ohio Public Defender's Office, and Parma Municipal Court Judge Kenneth Spanigal. Appreciate all of you for this discussion. You can find much more on this topic from the extensive reporting of our partners at cleveland.com. Just go to cleveland.com. You can also stay tuned this week for more coverage of the justice system from 90.3 WCPN and WVIZ PBS. You can find all of our stories by going to ideastream.org slash justice. I hope the energy and momentum from our conversation helps move us toward a system that delivers justice for all. I'm Mike McIntyre. Thanks so much for joining us. Cleveland Connects is made possible in part by a grant from PNC Bank.